Um, I'm Karthik. Uh, so uh, this would be a, a presentation on uh, some a talk, maybe a discussion, or whatever you may call it, uh, on uh, sentiment analysis with uh, TensorFlow. We'll also be discussing uh, some details about uh, how we can leverage Cloud and LP API, uh, as well as uh, we'll be talking about how to use the Google Cloud uh, machine learning, the, the GPUs on Google Cloud to actually uh, do some uh, TensorFlow training as well. So there are mainly three topics. So uh, let's 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 begin. So yeah. So before I begin, let me give you a brief introduction to myself. Uh, as I introduce myself, I am Karthik. Uh, I'm currently a data science researcher at SAP Innovation Center Networks. Uh, that's right across the street, uh, where I my day job is to uh, design models. So not the type of models that you think. Uh, so the, the models that I, we talk about are about neural networks, and so these are the models we talk about day in and day out. Uh, so that's the type of, uh, so we, uh, generally my work revolves around natural language processing. Uh, how do we deal with uh, uh, text? Uh, how do we uh, you know, understand what text is about? And how do we resolve uh, text, uh, you know, the, the context in which uh, someone has written something? So. Uh, under this, we are actually working on uh, the machine learning uh, API, which is called the SAPCLIA, uh, so which is a, a broader framework. But today, I'll be talking about the machine learning aspect behind uh, uh, you know, the, what I'm working on. Uh, I'm also currently the Google developer expert in machine learning. Um, so that, that's one more. And I'm a proud alumnus of uh, NTU. So yeah. So uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to know uh, uh, how many of you have, uh, you know, some, just a show of hands, uh, have you written code in TensorFlow? So how many of you have written code in TensorFlow here? So we have two, three, four people. Okay, that's, that's nice. So how many of you have written a deep learning network, uh, maybe like a machine learning framework itself? So have you, so I think only four of you, so maybe that is even lesser, so I presume uh, we have a, a, a big introduction, introductory audience here. So, um, okay, so uh, we, we'll still keep the content pretty technical, but uh, uh, the objective that um, this talk is trying to uh, have is basically, it's trying to target three types of audience. The theoreticians, basically people who are, uh, who have, you know, some introductory knowledge about natural language processing, someone who's interested to know what natural language processing is about, uh, someone who's, who wants to know what sentiment analysis is, uh, and pro probably some business use cases that could come along with uh, sentiment analysis. So the theoreticians, as I may call it. Uh, the practitioners are people who are actually involved in uh, developing uh, NLP things, but not particularly developing the NLP uh, framework itself, but probably using uh, some of the best practices for NLPs and probably using an NLP API to actually integrate into another uh, app or probably another business use case. So the practitioners is what maybe another set of people. Uh, and uh, so in this case, the second objective that we would try to uh, uh, deal with in this talk is basically figuring out how do we have uh, NLP, uh, how do we use these APIs and uh, understand probably the scalability uh, of uh, what Google Cloud and LP API could uh, give us. And the third one is basically the, theoret uh, the, uh, the theoretical practitioners, so people who are uh, both interested in the theory behind NLP, uh, probably developing, uh, you know, the, the, you know, writing on, re uh, reading papers and, um, you know, having, uh, developing general purpose classifiers for TensorFlow and probably training a deep learning network itself. So, uh, so these are the three objectives and the three types of uh, audience that uh, we are planning to cater to in this talk. Uh, because this is actually being projected uh, over the internet, I think there is some lag uh, in what you might see. So probably I might have to be a bit more slower than uh, if it was actually projected directly. So uh, let's, let's dive in. So um, uh, going in, so um, what is sentiment analysis? So this is one of the biggest topics uh, because it has quite a lot of influence on uh, what it can do, what it can achieve. Um, so probably, so this is a text that I would probably, uh, this is take, taken from one of the data sets that 
uh, was actually used. So probably could you tell me that uh, whether this is positive, negative, neutral? Anyone? Is this positive? Yeah, it looks positive, that's correct. So the second one is this one. So could it be positive, negative? Yeah, it looks, it's, it looks I would say, negative, yeah. Because uh, yeah, it says sh shattered image, it isn't complex. The third one, so this one uh, is stuck in the past again, but at least this time he has something better to do than code sitcom lines and try to woo Alicia Silverstone. So this again, uh, could you tell me if it is positive or negative? So I can hear some negative, some positive here. So this is the, the kind of uh, ambiguity that we are trying to deal with here. So there are some lines which are positive. It says Brendan Fraser is stuck here in the past again, uh, but he's at least trying something good, uh, not just who Alicia Silverstone, but actually this is negative. So according to the data set that we are trying to train, so we'll be training this as well. So this is actually a negative sentence. Um, let's move on. So that's a, that's a fourth one. So far from bewitching, the crucible tests uh, the patient. So this is kind of, again, uh, a kind of uh, here and there, but this is uh, actually negative. So uh, these are all uh, types of uh, you know, uh, texts that we are trying to deal with and figure out uh, what is happening. So what is the user or what is the text trying to convey? And how can we automate this? And uh, these are the reasons why uh, we want to actually understand sentiment analysis. We'll go deeper as to some of the uh, use cases here. So one particular use case that uh, is about probably you know, some of the developer, you know, developers would be interested in understanding the app popularity. So I develop an app. Uh, I upload it onto, say, Google Play Store or uh, the Apple App Store. And I want to know uh, what is the people sentiment. So the predominant problem here is that uh, I would rate something. So I would give it a 5 on 5. And, but I might actually give some complaints. So uh, the reason here is that, so this is one of the reasons why, actually why YouTube actually removed the star rating, if you realize that. So because people were actually giving some stars without knowing what it actually meant. So let's see what happens here. So for example, let's take Pokemon Go. Uh, so in this case, Pokemon Go was, is, is still one of the uh, biggest uh, apps on Google Play Store. Uh, so if you see on the right, we have a five-star rating, which is saying that the AR function is one of the best, and he's never seen something like this before. Uh, but if you move on to the middle, I think it's not pretty clear, but it says the game has some issues, where if I don't have a reliable internet connection, it won't work, which means no fun hunting Pokemon in exotic areas. You would think it might uh, let you do something offline, but exploring. So the point here is that uh, although he's given three stars, uh, the, the point is he's pretty ambiguous whether it's actually uh, a full five star or a zero star or a one star. So this is the problem with star ratings. So the, you, you don't know exactly uh, if your, your sentiment actually is reflective of the number of stars that you give. The third one that we would see is, is pretty straightforward. Over one million negatives, congratulations, Zeus was. So he's, he's actually pretty going on the negative streak. So he's giving negative because of the fact that he sees that there are actually some lower stars. So these are all the types of uh, reviews that we have. And uh, in general, as an app developer, I would like to know if uh, the stars and the text itself actually has any correlation or not. So in general, uh, not just the correlation, but what, are the, what is the part of the text that is actually very useful? In this case, probably, I would say he's given a three star because he's not able to find out that there is a reliable internet connection. So these, this is one part which I might highlight in this case. And uh, this is actually uh, something called the attention here. So we have a reliable internet connection, so in exotic areas. So these are all points which are going to contribute to why this is actually negative. So this is one example of what sentiment can do and what we can do with the analyzed sentiment. Moving on. So the next thing is uh, one of the biggest uh, issues is uh, Twitter right now. So the effect that Twitter has and uh, on the stock market is actually pretty uh, big. So for instance, I am not sure if you uh, remember, um, the wonderful Donald Trump actually came up with uh, a wonderful tweet about Boeing and him not actually taking up the, uh, the order for Boeing uh, for the Air Force One. And uh, the minute he tweeted that, uh, within a few hours later, Boeing's stock value actually plum plummeted. So the, the impact of uh, uh, Twitter or any social media text 
uh, in particular has a, a big effect on stock markets. So uh, in general, this is another big example of, uh, of how much uh, the, you know, the negative trend is actually propel, you know, uh, propelling uh, another company's trend, uh, stock market value. Uh, for example, here what happened is was, uh, everyone might know right now because we all travel frequently and invariably we would have heard this, Samsung's Galaxy S7, the Note 7, uh, had a huge problem and then people started talking about it so the more people spoke about it, uh, the, actually the sentiment on the stock market was actually quite reflective about how the Twitter trend was. So there are also a few papers that discuss about how uh, the Twitter sentiment or social media sentiment uh, affects a, a company's stock value. So all these contribute you know, uh, to what the reason why we want to uh, have or understand sentiment behind uh, users and uh, the, the feedback that they give. So some of the potential use cases. So yeah, there is some lag. So one of the biggest use cases is, is prediction. So as I said earlier, so analyzing stock market uh, trends from tweets or probably news articles is a big area. So if you think that if you, know, if you can actually have or, or develop an uh, 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 some, some sort of an ML framework that can actually sift through new news articles or sift through the social media and figure out that there is some issue with some of the you know, trends that some of the uh, stocks that you're uh, monitoring, then you are in for actually quite a big uh, game here because uh, doing a technical analysis or just looking at the star open and the close and then trying to build a neural network alone is not sufficient to actually understand the stock market. So in this case, this is trying to understand the emotion behind uh, you know, how, wh what affects the stock market value. The second case is where uh, this is again market sentiment to a new product. So something like, for example, uh, Samsung's Galaxy Note 7 was a prime example where uh, people started uh, giving some negative reviews. And I think there is one thing that started today as well about Samsung uh, S8. So where there is a red tint, and I think it's going on again, that's starting to, and people are actually coming back with more Instagram photos, and it's actually becoming, I hope it does not become another Note 7. So that, that's, uh, that's the thing that's happening. So people are now starting to look at Samsung's stock value already. So this is, this is the kind of impact that the, you know, the, the sentiment uh, of uh, all these uh, texts actually has. The third one is estimating a movie success. So for example, um, uh, if we can actually come up with so some way of uh, figuring out what the reviewers are saying and uh, how this uh, is actually impacting uh, the, so, the, the revenues for the movie, then we can also have some way of understanding probably what will happen the next time we have something similar over here. Uh, one of the biggest, another uh, areas of interest is on products. So how do co consumers react to probably a new update? So, for example, iOS, uh, I think 10.3 was out a few weeks ago. And um, so immediately there were some uh, people who actually came and said, I had some issues, and then some people. So these are all very important, actually, to uh, a company uh, to understand what, what are people talking about its products or probably its updates, its apps. So these are all uh, important areas of uh, interest. And of course, in politics, uh, this becomes a very important topic because uh, for example, yesterday, uh, Theresa May had actually in, uh, uh, proposed an election in June, I think. Now, and, and there is already an impact on the stock market, so uh, the British pound actually raised by two cents, I think. So this is, this is the kind of, uh, so everything deals with the, uh, what, what we are saying the, as a sentiment versus it directly having an impact on the stock market or on the foreign exchange. So these are all uh, prime examples where we can actually see there is a, a correlation with money here. So moving on, so there is a last thing is uh, the review itself again. So uh, does a movie uh, actually re uh, reflect commercial success? So that's one more point here. OK. So what the biggest question is, why is, uh, why is sentiment analysis so hard? Uh, to deal with, you know, if you're saying TLDR, then we are saying one of the problems is language uh, itself, the usage, uh, and then the second one is sarcasm and the lingo. So we'll we'll see what these three actually mean. Uh, in terms of language usage, uh, we are seeing that this movie is just brilliant. Actors are first grade, but the camera work is shoddy at best. So this is again an example from one of the data sets we have. 
uh, if you see, there are actually mixed uh, positive as well as negative uh, sentiments here. Uh, the first part of the sentence is brilliant, so it's, it's positive. And the second part is OK. It's the first grade, but the camera work is shoddy. So how do we actually rate this sort of a, a review? So this is more like saying, OK, there is two out of three is good. So probably it's, it's still 70% positive. So this, this is one way of doing it. But still, this is difficult. This is one of the reasons why uh, sentiment analysis is a big uh, reason why we want to understand how we can uh, see the sentiment here. Second one is, the film runs for a slick 40, 140 minutes. I was blown away by how true Einstein was after all. So this is sheer sarcasm. So what happens is, if you throw this to a neural network or any machine learning framework that's trying to understand sentiment, what this will try to say is, OK, the film runs for a slick 140 minutes, so which means that this has a positive sentiment. And the second thing is, I was blown away by how true. So this is, again, these are all positive. So as a human being, uh, we can understand uh, you know, what sarcasm is and how this actually makes sense to us that this is actually a negative review. But to, to an algorithm or someone who does not care about and then trying to you know, come up with simply a classifier that's trying to understand the sentiment, this would actually fail miserably. So this is one another reason why uh, uh, you know, sentiment analysis as, a, as just an algorithm will actually fail. The third one is very local. So this one was very interesting when I actually found it on one of the data sets. So OKLR, uh, I double checked with the hard hairdresser already. He said, won't cut very short. He said, will cut until I look nice. So I don't know what this means. Maybe there's a discussion on uh, why there was a haircut and then why the hairdresser was not going to cut it very short. But if you see, the, the point here is that uh, uh, local, local lingo and local uh, sentiments, local cul the cultural uh, usage actually changes a lot of the sentiment. So as if you train a neural network or any machine learning network on this data, it, it would invariably not understand what it's trying to say. So probably you will have a pre-trained model doing tr some sort of a, a test on this one, and then it would completely fail. Because some of the words are highlighted over here in italics. Uh, would would have no sense to the to the model. So this is one of the reasons why uh, it's important to understand local culture and why uh, so companies like Google are actually setting up local uh, you know uh, data centers where actually local sentiment is captured. So that's uh, one reason again. So these are the three main uh, reasons why sentiment analysis fails time and again. Moving on. So. For us to do sentiment analysis, uh, we still need to move from words to vectors, because in the end, we are trying to feed text into a computer. So that's, that's the reason why we are trying to move from word. So let's see how we could probably do that. So one of the reasons is, is, is that features, so re words are represented as features. And uh, when we do that, we are trying to build a vector from possibly the words in the in, in the english language so if you uh, could i maybe uh, is there a guess about how many words are present in the english language any guess sorry 1 million so i'm i'm talking about the probably the most widely used words so 1 million is i think is still i think correct but according to um, oxford i don't know the, the oxford dictionary is here uh, it says that there is actually 171476 words. Uh, so if you do a Google search for how many words are there in the English language, this is the first answer that it gives and the link to that. So uh, effectively, uh, when we want to build a word, you know, so probably an index, uh, we would still be, require some a vector of, say, probably 171,476. So the size of the vector would be as big as that to represent a word then. So because we are trying to represent it as an index. So now the, the challenge here is that if I'm going to, say, have a 10-word sentence, sorry, uh, yeah, 10-word sentence, then what will happen is effectively I would have to have a large matrix, which is going to be uh, 10 by 171k uh, uh, matrix. So that's huge. Right? So just to represent a sentence, which is just 10 words, it's, it's probably a waste of compute and a, a waste of space. So that, that's the biggest problem here. So uh, we have a large data set or large vocabulary, and we want to represent sentences or words, and then we want to uh, uh, make it uh, comprehensible to the computer. 
So one, one of the approaches that was actually very successful, still successful, is the bag of words approach. So what bag of words does is uh, it basically collects all the words in a sentence or in a document, and then it tries to come up with a vocabulary. So in this case, just like how 171476 is probably the most widely used words, uh, what bag of words tries to do does is it, it basically takes probably, say, 1,000 documents and then uh, reads through the documents to figure out how many words are present in the document and then come up with uh, a vector that's only probably representative of all these words in the documents. And so that is where, that is how we build the bag of words of model. So we have a, a vocabulary that's pretty small, that's very local to the documents that we have and the words in the documents. And once we do that, we actually, so now we limit the word dimensions to only the size of the vocabulary. I, I'll give you an explanation of what this is. I'll give you an example. Um, and then finally, we represent the words as basic counts of all these. Uh, we represent a sentence or a word uh, as a count of all these words. So let me see here, yeah. So for example, so uh, these are the two sentences. Probably if we are talking about, uh, we are not meant to save the word. Uh, we are meant to leave it. So does anyone know where these two sentences come from? Any idea? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is from interstellar. So the, the, uh, the idea here is that we have two sentences, um, and we are actually building a vocabulary. Uh, just as an example, so in this case, we have a vocabulary of size 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, 7. It's so about uh, nine words. And uh, what we would do is every time we represent the sentence, we are probably representing as the number of uh, word counts. So for example, if we build a list, then the list would basically have only we are not meant to save the world, leave it. Because the second sentence is going to be we are meant. So these three are words are again repeating. So when we represent the first document, we would be representing as all ones except the last two uh, words, which are basically leave and it. There is no uh, count of this in the first sentence. And the second sentence would be 1, 1, and 0, 1, 1, and the rest of three zeros and 1, 1. Because we have leave it, which is, going to, which is occurring in the last two. And uh, the rest of this meant to save the world is not present in the first. So uh, this is how we would represent uh, these two sentences. So if you see, this is actually pretty slick, you know, very, very small representation. For, uh, in, in, you know, if you consider 1, 7, 1,000 words, uh, if you had represented this as a 1, 7, 1,000 words, then pr probably it's a waste of space. But this way, we are actually uh, re reducing the vocabulary size. Uh, and we are actually having a good representation of all the data. Uh, but can, can anyone tell me what is the potential problem here? So by representing it as counts, and uh, any, any idea what the problem is? Sorry? Exactly, yes. That's correct. So that, that, the, the word ordering is not maintained. So if you look at it, uh, the second sentence is actually over here. This is 11011. So uh, the, the word order is completely missed here. So there is no way that we are. So if we suppose we say, so for example, um, um, John runs behind uh, uh, Jim, and Jim runs behind John would basically be the same sentence representation. So that is the biggest problem with bag of words approach. So, but still, it, this would still work in a majority of cases because what we are trying to do here is. We are trying to figure out the sentiment, or we are trying to, in, in our use case, this would be a, a very good example where uh, we could still use a uh, bag of words set of sort of representation, and then we could still get away with it. So I'll show you what is going to happen, and then we, we, we will discuss probably uh, more about this problem. So uh, we would move into something called the term frequency or the inverse document frequency, which is basically uh, how we actually give weights to different words in the sentence. So, uh, we are meant to leave this world, so in this case, world would be probably occurring once, so we give it a higher weightage. So V is again, again, again and again repeating. So what term frequency does is it basically sees how many times a given word uh, occurs again and again, and it's going to give it a weight based on how many times it represents, uh, it, it actually presents itself in a given set of documents. So this is, we can, uh, we can discuss in detail about this. If you're interested, we can talk about this. But we can use this representation to actually have a, 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 the, you know, weight the vector, the earlier vector, uh, as a better form. And uh, what we can do is we can get a better vector in terms of uh, uh, these weightage. Uh, once we get this, we can actually 
train a simple sentiment classifier. So I'll just show an example of what is going to happen. But in this case, what we would do is we would take uh, the movie review data set, which is basically from uh, Connell. Uh, this is a movie review for uh, probably about 1,800 movies. And um, what we would be doing is we would build a vocabulary, uh, like I showed earlier. We would just simply take a vector, and then we would uh, do a uh, term frequency, inverse document frequency, and then we would train a simple linear SVM classifier to say whether it's a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment. So uh, let's, let's get in. So, this is one of the, so uh, all my code is available on my GitHub. So if you're interested in training your own sentiment classifier, or if you're interested in uh, training your own neural network or TensorFlow network, so you, you can go to this uh, GitHub link and then uh, we, you can try it yourself. So let's, let's just move to the example. Yeah. So oh yeah, that's good. Okay. All right. So let's get to the first example here. Wow, that's pretty slow. All right. So uh, I hope you can see. Uh, let me just do a plus here. Okay. So uh, this is the example that I'm talking about. So. In this case, first, we would have some imports. So the imports are basically going to be scikit-learn. Um, so we, we don't want to be writing uh, the TF-IDF vectorizer and things like that. So we can use something off the, off the shelf. It's an open source, uh, very well optimized code. So uh, in this case, we would basically be importing scikit-learn. And uh, we would also be importing um, the linear SVM from scikit-learn. So, uh, once we do these two, so we are, these are the import statements, so uh, we are also importing the data. So the data is going to be something like uh, the polarity data. So here it's positive or negative. And uh, we'll also give an, uh, we'll see how this data looks like. Uh, am I going? All right, let's run through this code. All right. It's rather slow. All right, OK. Let me then move to. So we finished the imports. Uh, let me, yeah. So now, uh, like I said earlier, there are 2,000 reviews. And um, each of these reviews, uh, so we split the uh, review into 90 and 10. And basically, we have 1,800 reviews for training and uh, 200 for testing. So this is a very small data set. Um, what we are trying to see is we want to know what are the types of data that we have. So in, if we take just a debug here, we will best see, just see that the train review has, in the recent years, Harrison Ford has been such a grave screen presence calling through the likes of, so this is basically, a, the, the, there are actually quite a lot more, but I'm, I'm actually uh, truncating it to 100 characters. And this is actually positive, I don't know why, but it's positive, so bear with me. And the second is basically another test review. So the, in this, in the most interesting part of uh, can't hardly wait, just happens not to be most human. But so this is another example where uh, the sentiment is negative. So these are two cases where the you know we have the training data and the test data. So this is just a small debug to see if everything is good. Uh, next is we will build the vectorizer itself. So the vectorizer, like I said earlier, is basically uh, scikit learns TF-IDF vectorizer. What this basic tries to do is it comes up with, uh, takes in the data that we have provided, and it's going to build its own vector. So uh, when we do the vocabulary, it will tell us that there are certain, the vocabulary size, and uh, how much of the vectors it's going to actually train, and uh, the build, rather. So when we run this, let's, let's just run this and see what happens. So we see that the result, it fails. Fantastic. So, OK. So perhaps what is it? It says the documents only contain stop words. That's interesting. Okay. So what did I do wrong here? Uh, vectorizer. Okay. So <laughs> so this is Murphy's law running right here. So okay. Anyway, so that's why we have a, a nice Python notebook. So the reason is we can store all the output outputs here. So uh, in this case, the vocabulary length is one thousand four ninety five. Um, and we can actually see this from the vectorizer here. 
And once we are able to, so in this case, what vectorizer means is that, like I showed earlier, uh, we have nine words, and we were able to build a vector with a size of nine. And now, uh, with these 2,000 documents, or 1,800 documents, um, what the, the TFIDF vectorizer is telling is that there are 12,495 words, and we can actually vectorize these words into such a dimensional vector. And once we do this, we are actually basically training a classifier. That's it. So we are actually fitting the test data to this sort of a vectorizer data, and we are actually training a linear classifier. And once we train this classifier, we have some results, which are which is going to be this is the the matrix. So so the, there is a uh, it's going to say that the precision is such and such, and the F1 score. So it's basically saying what are the uh, the type of data, the average accuracy, the average F1 score, and all that. So so we can see that with a simple linear SVM and with a simple TF-IDF uh, vectorizer, we can actually do a pretty reasonably good uh, classifier for sentiments. So this is, of course, with only 2,000 documents. Now, the, the real challenge comes in when uh, there are actually large data sets. So for example, uh, IMDB has released its data set. So you can actually go, there is an uh, uh, ACL IMDB data set, which has about, I think, 60,000 or 25,000 reviews. Uh, it's actually quite comprehensive, so it's not just uh, positive or negative. It's from a rating zero to five, or I think one to five. And basically, the task is not just to say whether it's zero or uh, positive or negative, but also whether it's actually having any sentiment that's uh, on the rating scale as well. So uh, over and above this, we will actually see another example of uh, doing that. So let's let's switch back to the to the presentation here. Okay. So did we move back? Okay. So yeah. So one of the reasons, like I said earlier, uh, the problem with this sort of a framework is that uh, TFIDF wouldn't give any uh, any sort of uh, representation and that any sort of uh, uh, dealing with respect to the word ordering. So one of the improvements that we could uh, do is have our train a smarter network. So in this case, we can use word vectors like glove or word to vec So these two are uh, other sort of a framework which actually has word embeddings which are trained on shallow neural networks. So glove is not a neural network itself, but word to vec is a neural network which is actually trained on a shallow neural network. Uh, what word to vec can do is it's trying to come up with some embeddings uh, where something like we can actually do an inference on these embeddings to say, so probably we can do very interesting things like king minus man plus woman is what. And then it will come up and say queen. So things like those things, those sort of uh, wonderful inference can be done with word to vec or even with glove because uh, the training actually makes it semantically close to uh, its peers. So for example, man would be close to king, a queen would be close to women. So these vectors are actually uh, placed close by with one another. So that's one way to actually improve our, on our TF-IDF. But we are not going to do that today. We can do that for another topic, for another day. Um, another method by, is, is using call, something called skip thoughts. So skip thoughts is another uh, research project or so research where uh, what we do is we train an encoder decoder where uh, uh, we actually train the sentence and we try to get an encoding for the sentence. So again, this will give an en sentence encoding, sentence level encoding. And uh, this is not going to be like a word level uh, encoding, but this is another way of uh, improving classification accuracy. And one of the good things with skip thoughts is that it can actually, uh, it's, it's, you can apply it on a different uh, a wide varieties of uh, uh, applications, wide variety of uh, uh, problems. And uh, it's actually very, very interesting to use skip thoughts. So yeah, so if we want to try it out, skip thoughts is one way to go. And then the paper is even well written. So. Uh, if you want to give it a try, give it that. So let's let's go to the sentiment classification. This would be the demo. Let me move on. Uh, so like I said earlier, uh, one of the good things with Google Cloud is that uh, you get to try, uh, as, as a developer, if you don't care about what uh, NLP is, if you don't want to bother about how it's doing behind the scenes, then what you could do is you could use the Google Cloud NLP API. Uh, which gives similar uh, sort of uh, setting. So where uh, you throw in some text, uh, you would be able to get back the sentiment value. I'll show you examples of what it's doing and how what we can use. 
Uh, but for a, 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 first of all, I'll, I'll see. I'll give you an example of how you need to set up uh, the Google Cloud API. So the first thing you would do when you actually set up uh, the API itself is. Uh, uh, Sorry? Is it, okay. So I'll quit the presentation. Okay, I think this works, okay. Okay, that's because it's in full screen. Yeah, that's correct. So, okay, um, let me go back here. Uh, one of the, the first things when you do is you can go to cloud.google.com, and uh, yeah. So as soon as you go here, you can actually set up your console. Uh, I think you can set up your own uh, with some free credits the first time you test it out. Um, so once you get in, so you have to create a project. Once you create a project, you can actually set up billing and all that. So or with your $300 credit, you can do quite a lot. Uh, I've, I have a $100 credit, and I have not, I, my billing is still at zero. So that's, that's one good thing about the Cloud API here. So once you come here, you have to activate the different sets of APIs. One is the machine learning API here uh, and the Cloud uh, NLP API. So uh, you need to uh, activate those two APIs. And then when you create a project, you actually create this project and download uh, a JSON, which actually accompanies the project. So uh, these are all pretty straightforward. The documentation is very good. So all you need to do is uh, uh, just go to uh, cloud.google.com and then create a project. And then you can start working on these uh, projects. So I'll give you an example of uh, what you can achieve. So uh, just, just earlier, I actually gave an uh, the reason, so, so we had to import quite a few things and uh, do a lot more. So if you are if you are a developer who is not interested uh, in actually running through you know TF-IDF and figuring out what are the parameters to set, minimum frequency, maximum. So what you can basically do is uh, do the same thing, but only load the API, the data. So in this case, uh, let me do the same thing here. Hopefully, it does not uh, you know uh, fail on me this time. Uh, let me try out the same data. I should be getting the same data here. But the only thing that I would have to do here is uh, uh, to import the Google Cloud language. So the, this is, uh, you can import the language API if you actually uh, enable the Google NLP API. So once you go to Cloud, you have to uh, enable the NLP API. Uh, once you have that, you download the credentials. It's basically a JSON file. And you have to set it uh, as uh, export Google uh, the, the, I'll show you the uh, export path as well. So uh, once you do that, you can actually install the uh, G Cloud. And once you install G Cloud, you should be able to uh, use it on a Python. Uh, so you can use your Python to import the language, and uh, you can run different things. So uh, from here in this case, so we can let me run if this is, this is going to yeah, this is working, perfect. So uh, I'm, I create a client. So every time I create a client, uh, it's going to actually uh, create an instance, and then it is going to give me uh, with my API keys. And uh, so it's going to uh, every time I create a certain you know calls, it's going to actually see what are, what are the uh, capabilities that I have. Uh, if I've enabled an LP API, then it is going to give me all these access. Otherwise, it will throw an error right now. Um, so this is the DIR. So basically, I can do so many things. Uh, forget all the underscore underscore. You can go down here, so I can actually do analyze entities, I can analyze sentiment, and I can analyze uh, syntax. So these are uh, three big uh, tasks that we can do with NLP API. And the last thing is annotate text, so which can actually uh, do all three combined. So we, we will see an example of uh, how this does and what we can do with it. So the, the next call is basically going to be annotate. Ah, it fails again, so because of the doc. Hmm. I think I can run doc here. Yeah, now it should work. Hopefully, yeah, it does. So, yes. 
So what this I have passed here is basically uh, taken this. Uh, I'm telling annotate text uh, to get the sentiment uh, to include syntax and to uh, include. Sorry, so I'm only uh, telling it to do uh, sentiment analysis. I don't care about the syntax and the uh, entity recognition. So for this task, we would just do uh, sentiment analysis alone. Uh, and what we would basically do is we are actually this is a print result is basically just a decorator function. It's going to beautify uh, the sentiment itself. So uh, for example, in the in the in the example that we have earlier, so I'm passing um, I'm passing the sentiment of uh, what am I passing here? Okay, so because of the doc, so the doc is going to take a train data of IDX, which is basically a positive uh, or what is in recent years Harrison Ford. So this is the text that I'm passing it. Uh, which is positive, and uh, when I pass it through this, I can actually get different scores. Uh, the overall score is zero, and the magnitude is 7.2. So we will s go through what this means and uh, what it actually has. Uh, so yeah, let's go back. Okay. So once we've set up, so you need to export your Google application credentials, which is basically the JSON file, the path to a JSON file. And once you do that, you activate your uh, the G Cloud account itself. So it will basically uh, pass you uh, some uh, some SSH keys, and it will actually uh, create. Uh, so once you do this, you don't have to set it up again. So this is only a one-time thing. And once you have this, you can uh, run this Jupyter notebook. So effectively, you need these three steps beforehand. You need to uh, enable billing, uh, create a project, and then you need to set up the uh, give uh, the Cloud NLP API access, and then. Uh, you can follow these two steps, and then you can you're good to go with actually uh, creating the NLP your first NLP API, uh, API application. Uh, so one thing is you need to set up. Okay, so in this uh, in this movie NLP API uh, case, you need to set up the path. So like I said here, this is a kernel data set. So you you can set up whatever data you want, and you can pass in the data, and you can see the results. So but we still need to analyze or understand what the result is saying. So the score is basically uh, the 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 document. What it says is basically the emotion of the uh, the text itself that you passed, and uh, the magnitude is basically uh, all the you know, given a document. It basically says uh, how much of the emotional content is present in the particular document. So the score is an overall uh, estimate, and the magnitude is going to be individual uh, you know estimates of uh, different uh, lines in the document. So if I have 10 lines, it's going to give me magnitudes for all 10 lines. And the score is going to be an overall uh, score of the sentiment of the document. So if a score of 0, then uh, in invariably in this, in this case that we had, uh, so we uh, actually see that there is actually low emotion, which maybe it could also mean that it's actually mixed emotion, which is basically something like the example that we had earlier, where there is also a positive as well as a negative sentiment present in the text. So how do we deal with this case? We actually look at the, the magnitude. The magnitude will basically tell whether there is actually, uh, so which part of the sentence is going to have positive, or which part of the sentence is having negative, and things like that. So, so this could be a way to actually disambiguate between sentiments. And another, uh, the, the, you know, this is an example that uh, is available from the, uh, the cloud. It's, a, it's actually clearly positive if the score is 0.8. So it's completely positive, and the magnitude is, say, for example, 3.0. Uh, but it's actually neutral if it is somewhere, the score is somewhere close to 0, and the magnitude is close to 0. So the way you actually disambiguate uh, so you, uh, between uh, different sentiments is by actually having the magnitude. So magnitude is one way, and uh, rather the biggest way to, you can actually figure out uh, if, if a if sentiment is actually to, to leaning on one of the sides or the other. Uh, and in general, score will uh, range from minus one to plus one, and magnitude will be only from uh, zero to uh, it's, it's a, going to be a positive value. So you can get even a score of I think about six or five. Yeah. So so this is how you actually uh, disambiguate, and you would uh, try to figure out the sentiment of any given text or a, a, a list of lines, for example. <coughs> Moving on. So yeah, we just finished the API uh, in a demo as well. So uh, one of the other things that uh, the cloud API gives is uh, is the ML, uh, the GPU access. So uh, we actually showed an example where there is a toy data set. It's it's pretty small, about two thousand sentiments, and then uh, we just classify it using a linear classifier. It just trains within a span of I think twenty twenty five seconds. Uh, 
Uh, but the biggest challenge is, what if I have a huge data set? And I want to actually say, probably classify on a daily basis uh, millions of uh, you know, Twitter sentiments, and then I want to know what people are talking about. Uh, and so this is where we, uh, you, know, I, you might want to develop your own uh, classifier, and then you might want to see how to use it and deploy the model onto uh, probably a TensorFlow serving sort of an environment. So this is where uh, Google actually competes with AWS. So uh, one of the good things that I saw with this is that uh, when you set up an AWS account, the, co the costs are actually quite cheap right now. So I think this should be the case for some time now. Uh, right now for an hour, uh, so you first need to set up, uh, s similar to the last Google uh, console that I showed you, you need to still go to that place. So, uh, so uh, just like how you have an AWS uh, uh, VM instance, you can create a VM instance on a Google Cloud. So what happens is it actually uh, creates an infrastructure, virtual infrastructure for you, uh, but you can actually not use the GPU out of the box. What you need to do is you still need to request access. And uh, I actually requested access this morning, and within a span of five minutes, I was actually given access to one of the, so uh, there's actually a K20, K80 uh, GPU available. So you can actually do, uh, it, the instance actually comes out of the box uh, with a K80, so you, you can actually have some of the, uh, the, the, uh, the libraries installed, uh, or you can actually choose to install everything yourself. So uh, I didn't know that you could actually uh, install it yourself uh, uh, you know, on the, uh, when it actually creates the instance. So I had to do everything myself. So once you actually set up uh, the account, you, all you need to do is uh, just authorize the ML API and uh, just create the VM instance and request GPU access. So the GPU access is uh, currently on a different page right now. So it's a Google form that you have to fill. And once you fill the form, you will actually get a response within a span of five to 10 minutes. So you need to say which uh, region you want the GPU from. And uh, there are currently, I think, only three regions that, are, that have a GPU. Uh, I chose uh, Asia region one, Asia East region one. And I think there is one in US and one in Europe right now. So, so these are the, the way, this is the way you actually need to uh, set up a GPU access for uh, training your uh, ML, uh, you know, having GPU on your ML infrastructure on the cloud. And yeah, one point to note is that currently Asia costs the highest. So uh, I think it makes sense to actually use a, uh, the ML infrastructure on in the US, but the quota uh, actually it exceeds uh, in general because everyone's using a US uh, cloud, the, the, the GPU. So you, you, might, you, could, you might actually exhaust your uh, quota very soon. So I chose Asia because uh, I wanted to probably have access uh, any time and every time. So uh, there is a lot of documentation. You can actually go through these uh, the sets here. So these documents actually uh, give a comprehensive overview of what you need to do to set up your infrastructure. And suppose, uh, in my case, my Mac does not have a GPU. Uh, I want to actually run some training, uh, my personal, and then in this case, I can actually do that. Uh, I, I'm actually running the GPU behind the scenes, uh, and it, it actually it has not costed me anything. Uh, so I've been running this for the past three hours, and uh, right till now, I have not yet built uh, any cent, not even a single cent. So maybe I'll have to see tonight or something like that. But anyway, so the infrastructure is pretty good. So you get a K80 GPU to actually play with. Uh, so if you're signing up new, so then you will get a $300 credit. And if you're running some uh, GPU experiments, I think it will be quite uh, interesting to see uh, if you can, you can actually play around with $300 and you can uh, get quite a lot uh, of uh, you know, value for money for the $300 because you didn't pay anything for it. So, and then once you uh, complete all this, your instance would be ready, and it would be, uh, uh, I can show you what happens. You can basically uh, either configure your command line to connect to the instance, similar to if you used AWS before, then you can directly connect it to, uh, by configuring your SSH keys. Uh, I just wanted it to, you know, see how the browser interacted, so I just kept my, uh, you know, direct uh, uh, command line access from the cloud, from the browser directly. So, the minute you run this, so let, let me just go. So let me exit this. Yeah. So this is where you actually uh, come to this. Oh. Where am I? Is it doing something? Yeah, OK. 
I moved it from here to there. Okay. Just so, slow. Yeah, sorry? It's just slow in refresh. Oh, okay. So yeah, so this is the, the case. So uh, the minute you land on the page, you need to go to Compute Engine. And uh, when you go to Compute Engine, you can go to your VM instances, and then you can create your own instance. Uh, when you create your instance, all you need to do is you need to actually do, do quite a lot of customizations. If you uh, used Ubuntu or if you trained some ML infrastructure before, you will actually see that this is very similar to what you might have seen earlier. Uh, so in this case, you need to choose the uh, region that might be of interest for you. In my case, it was uh, uh, Asia East. And you need to customize this. So it depends on how many CPUs you would like to use. This is a virtual CPU. So in general, two should be sufficient. And you need to still go down. And then you need to choose, OK, so this is another one, Asia East, Asia East, A. Yeah, here you have. So you can choose either one, two, or uh, one, two, four, or eight. So if you have one, apparently it's half of the GPU that's allocated to you because uh, every die comes with two GPUs and then you're allocated half of it apparently. And uh, you, you are allocated a uh, Tesla K80. And uh, again, this you'll get an access to this only if you request access and you're provided access. Otherwise, you'll keep getting a weird notification saying uh, that you have exhausted your quota of zero GPUs. So that's a weird access uh, that I could show here. Yeah, it will keep saying that create VM instance of the boot disk, you have reached your limit of zero GPU access. So that's, that's one thing that was quite weird because it never told me what the error was. It just kept saying that it was a G zero. I, I tried this for quite a few days. I thought maybe uh, it was because the servers were busy. But it's not because of the servers. It's because of the quota. You, st you can go to your quotas page. You can see that there is actually a quota here. You can, if you click on this, you will know what are the quotas here. Uh, and then you can actually see which one. So if you see this Asia East is actually at 100%. So my uh, GPU is full, but otherwise I have not used any of my quota here. So, so this is how you actually figure out or understand what the quota thing is about, and you can actually uh, fix this. So it's, it's pretty straightforward once you understand what it is. Okay, going back to the cloud. Going back to my browser. OK, so uh, let's go back to the, my instance. Let me, so like I said earlier, you can basically open a uh, new SSH uh, console right from uh, the, the console window there. So it, what it does is it basically uh, creates a, co a command line window. If you're used, if you're used to using uh, Linux, then this will be very familiar to you. It's, you can do this again on your own command line, but this is a command line that is going to have everything pre-configured. You don't have to do anything for your SSH keys and all that, so uh, yeah. Here we are. So one more thing that I forgot to mention is when you create an instance, you can also customize your, uh, uh, the type of uh, OS that you want. So in this example, in this case, I actually f forgot to tell you that I had actually chosen an Ubuntu 16.04. So you can actually see that there, is, there are quite a few uh, uh, distributions available. For example, if you want Windows, you can use that as well. But right now, since we are trying out something like uh, a GPU on an Ubuntu machine, uh, I use 16.04 because I'm used to 16.04, but it's up to you whatever you would like to choose. You can choose that sort of an OS over here. And once you do that, you can customize this as well, and you can go back. I can choose 16.04, LTS, and persistent hard disk, OK. Yeah. Yeah, so once this is done, you just create this, and it clearly says that you will be billed for this instance. Uh, so yes, so you have to be careful if you're uh, running something, you will be billed for that instance. So whatever instance you create, it would create, it, because you're using a GPU, uh, it would say take a few, I think about 30 seconds to create your instance. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you can actually uh, uh, allocate this pretty fast. And one more thing is, uh, when you are creating, if you want to configure your SSH keys, if you have a project that you would like to share with your teammates, then you can actually uh, create SSH keys for, to share with your project. So you can create one, and then you can share uh, the, the key with your project mates. So this is one way, place where you have to do. So this is, these are things that are actually hidden somewhere. So you might have to figure out where this is, and then you will have to customize it for your own needs. But in general, out of the box, you can you you get most of the you know the most widely used 
OS with the, uh, the you know co the more commonly used uh, CPUs and things like that. So once you create this, you would be back here, uh, wherein you will actually have this sort of a yes. There's something called TPU, right? Yes. So I think it's still under. I don't think this is running a TPU yet because I can see that it's actually running an NVIDIA K80. So TPU, I don't think is running on the infrastructure yet, but I I heard that it's going to be there soon. So yeah, let's hope uh, it's going to be there soon. There was a paper, so I hope you read the paper recently. So they actually showed that uh, the TPU infrastructure is actually quite good uh, at low computes, so sorry, low uh, energy consumption. So it's it's that's actually a very interesting paper. If you want, you can actually read through the paper also. So that gives a lot more uh, idea about what is the cost that you have. So not just the cost in terms of money, but in terms of the impact that your server is going to have on the environment. So in that sense, the TPU paper was actually very, very interesting. So yeah, so now that we have our console up and running, so you can see it's a, it's a 1604 uh, Ubuntu machine. Uh, so out of the box, you might not have uh, um, most of the, uh, if, you're, if you're used to using NVIDIA, the GPU and stuff like that, you might not find, say, probably NVIDIA SMI running. But you, you could install it uh, directly. Though. So there are some scripts that you can actually follow to install it. Uh, for example, you can actually go over here. You can actually uh, see, the, they actually give you a script that is actually going to run out of the box. So that you can either manually install it, or when you create an instance, you can install it out of the box. So when it creates an instance, it's going to install some of the libraries uh, pre-installed. So you can do that as well. So once you do that, you should be back here. So one of the ways you test if your machine is running uh, a GPU is by doing an NVIDIA SMI. So NVIDIA SMI is going to tell you uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, how much of memory is available, what sort of uh, a GPU is running, the CUDA drivers, and things like that. So before, if you cannot run this, then your machine is not running uh, a GPU instance. So just uh, even if it, it might be running a GPU instance, but it is not enabled with the CUDA drivers for it to do the actual compute on the GPU. So that's one thing you will have to note. Uh, so once you do this, once you're set with this, then uh, you will have to go to Python. You can just install Python. So in my case, uh, I wanted 3.6. So I, ha I just installed Anaconda on this as well. Uh, so because Anaconda comes in with a lot more packages installed out of the box again. And uh, once you do that, you can just install uh, uh, TensorFlow uh, from pip. So pip install TensorFlow-GPU uh, would actually say, uh, would actually install GPU. Yep. So this sh the, okay. This is my thing. I should say install. So this is going to say come back and say everything is fulfilled. But this is what you might have to do out of the box. So when you create an instance, you need to check your GPU, and then you just have to install TensorFlow. And once you're good to go, uh, all you have to do, you, you can actually go forward with some of the examples. So uh, on the GitHub repository, I have actually uh, uploaded some examples. So let me just go quickly here. So one thing is the uh, TensorFlow itself. So it's going to be sentiment analysis using a simple uh, uh, single layer neural network. So that's not fun to test out. So what we can, let me just show you what are the cases here. So we have, so this is, these are some of the examples. So uh, I actually installed the CUDA repository. That's a Debian file. And I installed the Anaconda. So these are the only two things I've actually installed on this machine. And uh, everything else is just working out of the box. And let's go into Sentiment Analyzer. All right. So uh, in this case, uh, what we can also test it out is, is um, the, so like I actually told, uh, we, we, we want to actually see the power of the GPU. So, um, let me show you what I've had here for, for TensorFlow. So in this case, so this is uh, running a VI, so I'm just using an editor. Uh, so in this case, uh, all I'm doing is basically running a classifier uh, for training uh, on something called a spam data set. So it's going to classify e uh, emails as spam or ham, which is basically emails or not. So this is going to be uh, a very simple data set, but it's actually quite a large data set. Uh, in this case, it's quite challenging because um, you have, so what I'm trying to do is it's actually making the data set challenging rather. I'm making a batch size of 500 
and then I'm uh, testing a large, uh, a basically trying to train a huge neural network and see the effect. Uh, this would actually take some time on my local machine, but let's just see how quickly it can actually do uh, out of the box here. Yep. So all I have to, so when you, one, one more thing that you could notice when you actually uh, run TensorFlow on GPU is that the first few lines are going to tell you that uh, TensorFlow is running CUDA. Uh, it will tell you that some of the uh, libraries are available. It will tell that it's actually good to go. And it will start training. So if you see this case here, there's actually the first 500 iterations. This is an example where it's actually saying that there is a loss. So it's the training loss and the test loss. Uh, it's just doing a very simple classification. But in this case, we are actually training at, on a batch of 500 emails at a, at a single chart, at a single iteration. And uh, we are training this for close to I think this is 2,000 iterations or 20,000 iterations. And uh, you should see uh, that the loss is actually quickly falling. And the accuracy is uh, uh, raising for some time. And then after, I think, 0 0.85, it should kind of saturate. So this neural network is capable of running only up to about 85% accuracy. But this is a, a standard example of how you can actually train uh, and test everything just on the cloud. And you, you don't need to actually have uh, an expensive infrastructure on your local machine. So all you have to do is uh, you, need, you just need a browser that can actually uh, you know, create, you go to the cloud, and then you can actually run some simple examples like this. So Chrome should be more than sufficient for these examples. And in general, uh, it trains pretty fast. Uh, I can act I've actually done some uh, evaluations uh, with the CPU as well as the GPU. This is close to 10 times faster than uh, my CPU, uh, uh, the, the, the evaluation on my CPU. So, um, yeah, so that's some a case that we might have to consider when you're actually training huge uh, deep learning models on the cloud. So one more thing is that because this is an SSH uh, level access, you have an IP address that you can actually uh, copy into. So, uh, so it's actually, uh, this is actually very, very easy to, just like how you might have a server on your local infrastructure, it's just that this cloud is actually running somewhere else, and then all you need is the, the public IP, the global external IP over here that I can show here. So with this, I can actually copy, and then I, all I have to do is use this external IP to just SSH into this machine and use my credentials. If I have configured my SSH keys on my local command line, I can copy files directly into this. Or otherwise, you can anyway run, you can, uh, you can do a Git clone, or you can actually download data directly uh, into the into the uh, the VM instance as well, so that's that's one more thing that you can do. So those are different ways of access. So I think by the time I finish talking, it's already trained it. So where is it? Yeah, it's done already. So this is the the performance. So I also have uh, the notebook itself running behind that actually did this, and then it took quite some time. Let me show you what it did. So in the notebook, actually, it actually does uh, a few more things. It's actually going to plot the graph. And because there is no display on, my, uh, on the server, I just killed, I just uh, deleted all that part. So if you see the, the training loss and the test loss are actually going to go down considerably. And uh, if you see, there is actually not much overfitting here. There is actually no overfitting at all. And you can actually see that the train accuracy is actually is, is, uh, is stagnating after, say, probably about uh, 6,000 iterations. So that shows that the network needs to be more deeper and that you, will, you, may, you can probably have some uh, ways of improving this because the loss is still, the training loss and the validation loss is still at about 0 0.4. So which shows that there is some way to, there is some, still some uh, leeway to improve this network and gain some more accuracy in this. So this is an example of how you can actually train and then just you know copy the model and then do some evaluation locally here. So all you need to do is download the, the checkpoint uh, and the, the models from the server, and then you can actually uh, locally use that for inference on CPU. So that is uh, one way even we do. So when we, we actually train on uh, training infrastructure for the, all these machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, and then what we do is once it's trained, we copy the model locally, and then we do the uh, inference on our CPU. So, uh, that that's in general the the way we uh, actually train neural networks. So there is also one more example that you can actually try out on the GitHub repository. It's basically the word vectors. 
So what the word vectors are are basically, uh, again, like I said, it's, it's uh, a way to actually see uh, and visualize uh, the, the fact that I was telling you earlier about the king minus man plus woman is equal to queen. That's sort of an uh, evaluation. That's the word to vec. So if you see what uh, TensorFlow can do, you can actually see that it's actually very interesting that it can actually do this. And I somehow seem to, yeah. OK, so these, all the, 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 uh, this cloud is basically uh, all the word vectors. And what this, uh, this is basically an embedding cloud. Uh, this is on TensorBoard. What TensorBoard does is it basically gives you a way to see these, or rather visualize these in terms of a cloud. So I can actually go down here. I can actually see you know, different, OK, I think it's slow to refresh. But it's basically a 3D cloud that can, I can actually choose. These are actually numbers right now. But if you can, uh, I, I should have actually converted this into words. But effectively, what I can do is I can choose some words here and then see which are the words that are close to one another. Uh, if you actually choose the words properly, you can actually see that the example that I gave, where uh, man and woman are probably numbers are actually clustered close to one another. And city names are actually close to one another. If you see here, uh, France, and if you actually, uh, I, I, we still need to do some work over here. But if you see the actual word embeddings here, the, the index behind, the, there is a words behind these index. It would be probably uh, France, so things like country names, uh, things like uh, people. So all these would actually be clustered uh, in some space. So uh, one more thing that you can do with this TensorBoard is you can actually select some of the, uh, the characters. And then you can actually see what are the, so in this case, I can see, OK, for, I'm uh, interested in this particular area. I can see what are the uh, embeddings in that particular area. And then I can zoom in and zoom out and see how, diff how far these embeddings are from one another. Oops. Yeah. So those are things that you can actually do with uh, TensorBoard. So you train uh, on the cloud. And then you can actually save all these uh, embeddings uh, to a file. And all you need to do is copy those, the file. And then see, uh, you can just view a, a TensorBoard locally. So there's also another way to configure TensorBoard on the cloud as well. So that, that's also another way to go. But this is an easier way. And all you need to do is uh, you just have TensorFlow installed locally. And you can uh, you know, already uh, evaluate and see how these embeddings are. So that's one more example here. Let's go back to our presentation. So yeah, so we have come towards the, the final press here. So for, we actually started off with uh, a simple introduction to what sentiment analysis is and how we actually use tens, uh, term frequency and uh, you know, inverse document frequency to probably classify text into uh, positive and negative, free, uh, uh, negative classes. And we also discussed some improvements, like probably you could use word to vec or use glob ve vectors. Uh, we also saw an example, a running example of uh, how to use Cloud NLP API itself uh, to do the inference, to, do, to get sentiment values, to get the scores and the magnitudes. So you can actually use that. So one more thing that is also available is uh, there are actually, uh, the Cloud API is now, I think it can work on Spanish, it can work on Japanese, and it can work on one more language with English. So these are also some capabilities of the NLP API right now. Uh, so that is also possible. One, uh, if you're interested, you can also do entity recognition. And you can also do, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, some more. Uh, and I think it's, it's, again, I'm not sure. But you can actually do one more. It, it has one more capability to actually uh, go along with, these, uh, with sentiment and with, uh, um, with entity recognition. Uh, in the third case, we actually developed a general purpose classifier for with TensorFlow. So if you want to get deeper into the TensorFlow classifier, you can actually uh, download the code. So the, uh, the Python notebook is available on my repository. Uh, so it's, the network itself is a, a straightforward network. But the idea is to use tensor, the, you know, the TF-IDF vectors. Uh, how would you actually interchangeably use TF-IDF vectors with TensorFlow? Uh, seamlessly, you can just move from uh, scikit-learn sort of a simple model to something like a TensorFlow sort of a, 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 a you know machine learning toolkit, which can actually do uh, complex uh, uh, inferences and uh, train de deep neural networks. And uh, yeah, finally, we also gave gave an example of how you can use the GPU uh, on the cloud and uh, how this is actually you can actually use this uh, for inference and for training as well. So. 
those are uh, all the so if if you are also interested uh, uh, the sentiment analysis there was a uh, recently there was a wonderful paper from deepmind so it's called unsupervised neurons so it's actually another paper that's uh, pretty much uh, tuned towards the theoretical practitioners so who are interested in reading what the current state of the art is so this paper actually talks about uh, unsupervised methods for which they it actually learns to uh, classify sentiment by itself so this is actually a very very cool paper so when you read it it's actually phenomenal how they even the authors claim that we don't know how it actually did that but it did that so that's a sort of uh, uh, the, you know the paper actually gives how much uh, the the field is progressing and how exciting it is to uh develop such models and see what it can actually do so yeah so that's one paper that probably you can also read uh and it does not matter if you can not re you know understand all of it or part of it but it's it's still worth reading the paper because it's pure uh, you know it's it's so cool and the the way it can actually do things so yeah so uh, if you have the chance go ahead and read the paper yeah yeah thank you very much So if you have any questions uh, you can ask me Hey this is a good talk about sentiment analysis my question is uh, have there any solution for either ironic detection or or security detection Okay so the question was uh, uh, is there any work that's actually there on uh, irony right Uh, so that's the problem. That's the irony here. Yeah. So uh, we do everything that. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's very difficult for uh, to understand irony. So in most cases, we actually train uh, supervised data sets. So in this case, like we have a positive or a negative sentiment. We have something like uh, uh, training on something that's actually. Uh, so all the data sets are actually tuned towards certain large tasks. For example, detecting if an email is ham or spam. so things like that are actually a pretty much big topics that are actually uh, of interest to the major audience uh, since still we have a lot more things to achieve so uh, we have a lot more places to go before we can come to the point of irony detection but the the use case for irony detection is actually could you maybe let me know what you have an idea of use case de- for irony detection do, do you have an idea like uh, is there a reason for you to mm-hmm. Detection, detector, anonymous. Okay. But how did you do the uh, the evaluation for that? Uh, I used many algorithms to do evaluation. So you have an actual irony data set? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. So the the NLP API, uh, if I am right, actually uses an ensemble method. So maybe I could look it up, but uh, it uses quite a few methods. Uh, in, so if you read the so uh, Google, uh, so TensorFlow has open sourced uh, the SyntaxNet. So SyntaxNet is basically ways to actually identify the entities in in a sentence. So you can use these entities to figure out what is the sentiment as well. So So I think it could probably be an extension of syntax net and a lot more than just uh, yeah. So it's pretty trained. Yes, it it should be pretty trained on so because Google would have a lot more access to data. So it is of course pretty trained on uh, probably all of the data set that Google has probably a, a huge data set. Yes. Oh okay. <laughs> Uh yeah so if you have no other questions then uh, thank you very much sir thank you very much